Okay, may I have a motion to, uh, oh, we're out of it. May I have a motion to come out of executive session? So moved, Your Honor. Second. Can we state the motion? You have to state oh, yeah. it. I move the city commission adjourn from executive session and continue with the meeting. I second the motion. Ms. Lavender, may we please have, the, please have the roll call? Mayor Whaley. Aye. Commissioners Lovelace. Aye. Williams. Aye. Joseph. Aye. Mims. Aye. Okay, the Dayton City Commission meeting will now come to order. Would you please rise for the invocation and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance? This morning, the invocation will be delivered by Commissioner Joseph. Dear Lord, please grant us the ability to lead and serve our community proudly and honorably. Please help us look towards your humility for guidance. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Ms. Lavender, may we please have the roll call? Mayor Whaley. Aye. Commissioners Lovelace. Aye. Williams. Aye. Joseph. Aye. Mills. Aye. Okay. May I have a motion to approve the minutes of the March 19, 2014 meeting? So moved. A second. It's been properly moved and seconded to approve the minutes of the March 19, 2014 meeting. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ms. Lavender, are there any communications or petitions? All have been distributed, Your Honor. Okay, great. Well, this morning I'd like to invite Ms. Ashley Smith with the Bombeck Family Learning Center to the podium to give us a community update and become our latest um, group for the uh, City of Learners. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Good morning. So good to be here. My name is Ashley Smith and I'm the director at the Bombeck Family Learning Center. We are the demonstration school for the University of Dayton's teacher education programs, specifically early childhood education. We serve children ages six weeks through entry into kindergarten in our four-star rated NACI accredited <coughs> early care and education facility. I was so happy to be asked to share with you what our teachers, classrooms, and students are doing every day to educate our youngest Daytonians and share how we are promoting your City of Learners campaign. At the Bombeck Family Learning Center, we teach our young students to be critical thinkers, problem solvers, and provide experiences to provide the foundational skills that children will need to one day enter into our region's workforce that is rich in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The National Association for the Education of Young Children states that valued content is learned through investigation, play, and focused intentional teaching. Children learn by exploring, thinking about, and inquiring about all sorts of phenomena. These experiences help children investigate big ideas. Big ideas are something that we focus on at the Bombeck Family Learning Center through our access curriculum. The curriculum was developed by teachers, administrators, the curriculum specialist, and middle and early childhood faculty. The curriculum stresses children understanding concepts rather than facts and knowing how to think rather than what to think. Teachers use the children's interests to plan investigations on topics worthy of study that will provide rich opportunities for learning, such as fabric, robots, the moon, architecture, and bridges. Using children's questions as a map, teachers identify big ideas associated with these topics and plan hands-on, engaging experiences that use materials children can touch, feel, smell, hear, and taste to support deep conceptual understandings of these big ideas. We believe in using a curriculum and teaching strategies that promote an inch-wide, mile-deep approach to education rather than the inch-deep and mile-wide approach of the past. As part of our mission as a demonstration school, our teachers mentor future educators in research-based best practices in the early childhood classroom. Through this mentoring process, we hope to place teachers in local schools that will be able to advocate and promote for this type of teaching and learning. Teachers who understand the changing needs of the area and are able to help you create a city of learners in their future classrooms. As part of the 92nd lecture series produced by the University of Dayton to highlight cutting edge programs, the Bombeck Center and Dr. Shauna Adams created a 92nd lecture titled, Can We Use the Power of Play to Educate an Innovative Workforce? I think I'm gonna share that video with you now. Um, so it kind of recaps what I just spoke about in a much more succinct way, fun way. <laughs> Do you want me to hit play? I think so. Okay. Can we use the power of play to educate and innovate a workforce? 
When you think of learning, you might think of the traditional pedagogy of rote learning in classrooms. But in most cases, play can do a better job of supporting learning. I'm learning about math. Young children are like scientists. Their purpose in life is to make sense of their world. Think about this example. If I want to teach a group of preschoolers to start writing numbers, is it best to sit them down and show them how to write the numerals? Or is there a better way? Look at how engaged they are in learning. They have a purpose for using numbers, and you can see how the numbers and measurement and amount can be used in a way that has meaning to them. These preschoolers are engaged in the engineering process as they learn the best way to build bridges. In their play, they identified a problem, proposed possible solutions, tried them out and made a plan. After extended trial and error and with a little adult assistance, look what they built. So as we adults are struggling with our need for a more innovative workforce, we might want to learn a lesson from our youngest scientists. They figured out the importance of play. Can we use the power of play to educate and innovate a workforce? Absolutely. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> So do you have any questions? Uh, any questions? I just want to make a comment. Um, I see my granddaughter yes. there. She graduated from the program she last did. year. She did. Uh, and she's so smart. Yes. That she is. She's yes, yes. She has had a tremendous uh, graduation ceremony. Uh, they all look so serious. Uh, <laughs> In, in their oversized shirts. Yes. You know, with a little cap on it. So yep. again, uh, uh, big thank you because the, the, the whole process just seems to work so, so well with them, and uh, I enjoyed every bit of it as well as she did. Thank you. We hope to um, push, push uh, up on that push down a little bit here yeah. in the near future. Right. So. Great, Ms. Smith. Any other comments? Nope. Ms. Lavender, we have a certificate. Wonderful. City of Learners Certificate of Appreciation, Bombeck Family Learning Center. The Dayton City Commission wishes to recognize and commend your commitment to education and creating a more educated workforce in our community. Your efforts will serve to inspire others to join the movement to make Dayton a city of learners. And the certificate is signed by the mayor and the city commission. Thank you very Thanks much. for all your Thank great you. work, Ms. Smith. Go Flyers. Go Flyers. Thank you. <laughs> great. Next, I'd like to invite Ms. Jane McEwen, presenting, representing the Mentoring Collaborative of Montgomery County AmeriCorps program to the podium to receive a proclamation for National Service Day coming April 1st. Good morning. Good morning. Well, yes, you could all just come and stand right beside her. That would be great. <clears throat> Fantastic. Perfect. Good morning. Good morning. I am Jane McEwen, again, the project manager for the Mentoring Collaborative AmeriCorps program. And to the mayor and uh, the commissioners, thank you for allowing us to be present to receive the proclamation. Um, this is our second year. The actual event is on April the 1st. And in lieu of your absence, uh, we're pleased to announce that Commissioner Williams will be reading at uh, Kemp's uh, Elementary School to a group of youth during that day to actually commence the day. And we do continue to have uh, 20 members, four of whom are with me today, serve in 13 of our host sites throughout the city and the county. And several of all of our partner agencies, our host sites, are partnered with a Dayton Public School. These members serve as tutors, they oversee mentoring programs like at East End, Parity, Paste, uh, Dakota Center, um, Project Read, Stivers, Great. and just to name a few, we're all throughout uh, West, we're now in West Carrollton and also now in Trotwood. So we are growing and we're pleased to be here and we're pleased to have uh, Mr. John Moore, our co-chair with us as well. So thank you. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If the AmeriCorps uh, volunteers <coughs> could uh, in introduce themselves, say where you're where you're um, spending your time, that would be great. Uh, my name is Katie Baker. I'm at East End uh, Ruskin Elementary, and I work with first graders and kindergartners. Great. Okay. My name is Jordan Lewis. I am at West Carrollton City Schools, and I uh, serve with uh, educators working with four to eighth graders, and we're building a new mentoring program for the entire district right now. Okay. okay. 
My name is Cassie Rosario, and this year I am serving at Stivers, and I work with different teachers throughout the day, or I serve with different teachers throughout the day um, from all the grades 7 through 12. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My name is Purity Chitwood. I'm serving with Project Read. Three days a week, I am at um, an early learning center. I tutor second graders, and in the evenings, I'm with Project Read, and we do adult literacy and GED placement. Wonderful. Okay. Wonderful. You'll be reading, Commissioner Williams? Yes, I am. To celebrate April 1st? Yes, I am. I, I've, I've, I have not selected what I'm going to read or I've been given what I'm going to read, but I'm sure there's going to be something very entertaining and educational. Wonderful. Absolutely, and thank you. I, thank I look you forward so to it. Thank you. Thanks for all you do. We appreciate you coming today. And uh, April 1st is a great opportunity for us to really champion the great work that you do in the community and encourage others to be a part of the program, right? So Absolutely. we appreciate you coming down this morning, being a part to champion what community service can do both for you and for the whole community, and we really appreciate your service. Ms. Lavender. Proclamation from the Office of the Mayor, the City of Dayton, Ohio. Whereas, service to others is a hallmark of the American character and central to how we meet our challenges. And whereas, the nation's mayors are increasingly turning to national service and volunteerism as a cost-effective strategy to meet city needs, and whereas AmeriCorps and Senior Corps address the most pressing challenges facing our cities and nations, from educating students for the jobs of the 21st century and supporting veterans and military families to preserving the environment and helping communities recover from natural disasters. And whereas national service expands economic opportunity by creating more sustainable, resilient communities and providing education, career skills, and leadership abilities for those who serve. And whereas national service participants serve in more than 70,000 locations across the country, bolstering the civic, neighborhood, and faith-based organizations that are so vital to our economic and social well-being. And whereas national service participants increase the impact of the organizations they serve with, both through their direct service and by recruiting and managing millions of additional volunteers. And whereas national service represents a unique public-private partnership that invests in community solutions and leverages non-federal resources to strengthen community impact and increase the return on taxpayer dollars. And whereas AmeriCorps members and senior court volunteers demonstrate commitment, dedication by making an intensive commitment to service, a commitment that remains with them in their future endeavors. And whereas the Corporation for National and Community Service shares a priority with mayors nationwide to engage citizens, improve lives, and strengthen communities and is joining with mayors across the country to support the Mayor's Day of Recognition for National Service on April 9, 2013. Now, therefore, I, Nan Whaley, Mayor of the City of Dayton, do hereby proclaim April 1, 2014 as National Service Recognition Day in Dayton. And the proclamation is signed by the mayor and affixed with the city seal. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all of your <coughs> great work. Thank and you. Mm -hmm. look forward to seeing you in the community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. Thanks for coming this morning. Next, I'd like to invite Mr. Pete Hager, Director of Central Services and the Division of the Purchasing Staff, to the podium to receive a proclamation for National Purchasing Month. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. City Manager. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, team. Great. Uh, actually, with, if it's the mayor's and commission's pleasure and, the, and okay with the manager, I'd like to introduce Matt Larrick. He is the buyer in purchasing who took the lead on requesting the proclamation, and he has just a few comments to make about National Purchasing Month. Mr. Great. And he has a great tie on today, so that will be allowed. I, very good. Thank you. Mayor, commissioner, city manager, uh, thank you for allowing us to celebrate this month. Uh, when we celebrate Purchasing Month, we are acknowledging uh, an elite group uh, of professionals that really do um, advance the efficiencies and effectiveness of governmental purchasing. So before I go on, I would like to introduce our staff. We have Diane Maley. She's the Executive Secretary to Central Services. Uh, we have Joey Shope. He is our buyer. Uh, Kevin Kuntz. He is the Assistant Buyer. Lakeisha Washington. She is also a buyer. 
and uh, Danita Garner, she is our senior buyer. We also have Nicole Fox, uh, who is a buyer, but she is out today. Um, the purchasing and supply management profession plays a significant role in the quality, efficiency, and profitability of businesses and government throughout the United States. This month acknowledges an elite group of professionals that have made a difference in the government and private sector. Uh, the goal of our purchasing agents that you see here is to assure the highest value of the taxpayer dollar. And we believe strongly that every day we come to work, we do that. So thank you again for allowing us to have our month. Great. Okay. Great. Well, we're really glad for all the great work you do and appreciate uh, you keeping, uh, being good financial stewards of the taxpayer dollar. It's really important to us and we have confidence that when something is bid that you have a process that works through that we have confidence when we, uh, when we vote on those. So we appreciate the partnership we have together. Commissioners, you okay? That's yeah. great. Congratulations. Yeah, thank, you. Yeah. thank you. Thank you. Well, we have a proclamation for you before you walk mm -hmm. away. Ms. Lavender? Proclamation from the Office of the Mayor of the City of Dayton, Ohio. Whereas the purchasing and materials management professions play a significant role in the efficiency and effectiveness of both government and private sector businesses. And whereas purchasing and materials management professionals through their combined purchasing power spend billions of dollars every year and so have a significant influence upon economic conditions throughout the world. And whereas the National Institute of Governmental Purchasing, Inc., the Central Ohio Organization of Public Purchasers and other professional purchasing associations throughout the United States and the world engage in special efforts during the month of March to inform the public about the importance of role played by the purchasing profession in business, industry, and government. Now, therefore, I, Nan Whaley, Mayor of the City of Dayton, do hereby proclaim March 2014 as National Purchasing Month in Dayton. The proclamation is signed by the mayor and affixed with the city seal. Thank you all. Thanks for coming Thank down today. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Mm -hmm. Appreciate what you do every day. Thank you. Ms. Lavender, are there any additions, deletions, or comments to the calendar? I have none, Your Honor. Mr. Reardon, any additions, deletions, or comments to the calendar? Uh, yes, Your Honor. First of all, I would like to add one item. It's a real estate acquisition, and I think uh, Ms. Lavender has the uh, information which will be added and uh, put in its proper place on the calendar. And, Your Honor, that calendar item will be numbered 15A. Thank 15A. you, Ms. Lavender. And there are a number of uh, items that I'd like to have staff comment on. The first one I'd like to call Mr. Pete Hager to the podium and talk about items A1 to A3. These are three items that relate to the VoIP, the new telephone contract, to have him talk a little bit about the system and answer any questions you might have as well. Mr. Hager. Thank you, Manager, and good morning again, Mayor and Commissioners uh, and Clerk. Uh, items on the calendar this morning, A1 through A3, uh, we're recommending three major components to move forward with the implementation of the new telephone and data network systems, some upgrades to the data network. Uh, item A1, Fulton of Ohio, uh, covers the uh, VoIP telephone system and the new IVR for the finance department. The item A2, Integration Partners, deals with the data network upgrades uh, to uh, enhance those to be able to carry the voice component across the network. And then Pro on Call, item A3, uh, is the telephone line services or the public switch telephone services. An additional contract recommendation will be forthcoming for AT&T for wide area network services. Uh, we were in contract negotiations with them up until Monday of this week finalizing that. Uh, so we don't have that one. We hope to have them all together on the same agenda. That one will be forthcoming shortly. A couple of just highlights about what we're, what we're doing. The city's annual operating cost in 2013 for the existing in, uh, <coughs> telephone system was just over $1.2 million. The projected annual operating cost for the new system, which is a state-of-the-art system, is projected at around $400,000. So about a third of the operating cost annually for the telephone system. Uh, if we include the capital cost that we have before you today, um, we're looking at a five-year 
savings of about $2 million. These are conservative numbers on the forecast that we've put together. The City has retained the services of Ellert and Associates to design and scope the systems, assist in the analyses and evaluations of the proposals, and serve as the implementation project manager for this activity. Uh, while the phone system is referred to a couple of just a couple of points of clarification that I thought would be important to make we call it a voice over internet protocol and I'm emphasizing the word protocol because many times we think of VoIP in, in that acronym voice over internet and we think that the phone the voice is actually going out to the internet and through it and back into the recipient and that is not the case. So I wanted to make that clear. This, this, the voice will actually transmit across the city's network. Um, it's voice over internet protocol, which means that it's transmitting over a data network. In this case, it's the city's network. It is secure. It is encrypted. Um, so actually, there are some security features that we have for voice communications with the new system that we don't have today. The, net, the networks are designed with uninter uninterruptible power supplies to provide minimum of 30 minutes of battery backup power for voice and data communications, which exceeds the design of the existing phone system that we have today. Uh, in the event of a power outage, the UPS would power the telephones. For those city facilities with backup power generators, the ge then the generators would take over. The system is designed to satisfy or surpass FCC regulations regarding 911 service requirements. Uh, the IVR replaces an obsolete unit and includes multilingual speech recognition, an important feature for an immigrant-friendly city. It allows callers to select callback, uh, retaining their place in the queue, or to schedule a callback at a more convenient time. And it provides many other customer-oriented features that we are not able to offer today with our existing system. Highlights of some of the telephone system features and functionality include the ability for some users to instant message, detect what we call presence, so you can visually see on your computer screen if someone is available to receive a call, if they're out of the office, if they're not available, if they're on their phone, um, to video call and video conference text-to-speech and speech-to-text. So if you are getting an email that you are driving and can't read, but you would like to hear what that email says, you can have it spoken to you. Um, so find me with call forwarding, so it will bring to your office <coughs> or on your home phone, wherever you have it grouped. Call groups and outbound employee notification. Also provides a detailed cost accounting system so that we can keep track of what we're spending, where we're spending, and why we're spending it. The project implementation timetable is tight. We look to have implementation performed by the end of August. The Central Services Department's IT division worked with and formed a core project team that included IT division manager Dessa Foster, Keith Davis, Shabu Varghese, Joyce Holloway, Nicole Fox from Purchasing, and myself. More important, <coughs> two really big things for me from the work that we've done on this project personally to this point. Uh, we wish to acknowledge and thank the following departments who provided staff to assist with getting this project this far this quickly. Aviation, Pam Hickson. Building Services, John Callaghan. Dayton Municipal Court, Doug Baltus. Finance, Sheila Kraft. Finance Department Consultants, Pytech, Tina Bastillo and Phil Beach. OMB, Diane Shannon and Josh Brown. Public Works, Tom Ritchie, Jr. And Water, Paul Raglan and Laval Glasper. I say that that's important to me because, personally, because it has been so rewarding to have the opportunity to work with such fantastic people inside the City of Dayton organization. And the other reason it's really important to me is because working with the consultant that the city has retained and working with this group of individuals from the city and going around to site visit the various proposers and check their offerings and do our due diligence, I receive so many compliments about the city staff, their energy, their diligence, their attention, and just great positive comments virtually everywhere we went. 
as we went through the process to get to the state of making a recommendation to you today. I wanted to share that information with you as we ask for your consideration in these recommendations. I'm glad you did, Pete. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Commissioner Joseph, I'm sure you have a lot of things to say about this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm transparent, am I? Yeah. Uh, yeah, been talking I, about it for a while. I, I've been talking about this for a long time. Uh, Mr. Hager, thank you for your work on this and thank everybody the city staff has put this together. Uh, it, I was looking back to see uh, how long I've been using at other places VoIP systems and it's almost eight years now, both in uh, private and public uh, sector context. I've been very happy with it. Uh, I, the savings is actually greater than I originally expected, so that's a credit to you, I think, for figuring out the best way to do this. Um, and the, the other features that you mentioned uh, are very helpful in work context, I will say, outside of just phoning. But I've been pleased with the, the results that I've had in other places, and I'm glad that we're going to this. Um, so th thank you for your work. If, if my colleagues want to have a discussion about uh, what my experience has been, I'm glad to, to do that. But I, I fully support this, and I, I hope you will, too. Yeah, I'm ex I, it sounds good to me. I'm excited mm -hmm. about it. Good work. Uh, a couple of just quick questions to make sure I'm clear. Um, Sounds like the upfront capital expenditure is going to be about $2 million. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And we expect to save is it roughly $800,000 a year? Or? I didn't add it by year. I didn't bring that spread to you. But well, that, 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 that's, ballpark. Yes, that's about right. So we're spending mm -hmm. 1.2 now, and it's going to be about 400 400, 400 yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're saying it's about a two-and-a-half-year payback. That's what we expect. That is correct on the capital part okay. portion. Mm -hmm. About two years, yeah. That's, that's actually very strong. I yeah. mean, to have yeah. a two, two-and-a-half-year payback is very good, so. Um, congratulations on your negotiations, as Commissioner Joseph just stated. The um, only thing I want to know about, if you just make us feel, I mean, you've talked to us about it, but just for those who are listening, talk to us about the implementation. I mean, when, we've, when you do things like this, certainly the features are great. Once it's in place, as Commissioner Joseph said, they're wonderful. But sometimes implementation can be challenging. Can you talk to us about, you know, our thoughts around implementation and, you know, what are our backup if um, there's issues? I can speak to that a little bit, Commissioner. It's an excellent question. Um, not only is it an excellent question, I think the first thing that I should do is acknowledge with an implementation of this magnitude and scope, there will be issues. Right. We know that there will be issues. So that's why the question is so good. <coughs> if we uh, achieve the approval of the Dayton City Commission this morning to proceed and the authority to do so, we have tentatively scheduled a kickoff meeting with the major partners in this process for next Wednesday, April 2nd. And that includes Ellert & Associate, the city's consultant, who will serve as the implementation project manager. Each of the four major contributors, contracted contributors to this project, will be required to appoint a project manager. That project manager for each of them will report to the city's retained project manager, which is Ellert & Associates, and they report to uh, the city of Dayton, Ellert & Associates does. Um, so our, we have a master project manager and implementer who, will, uh, who is very uh, uh, seasoned and has many, many public sector deployments of this nature across the nation. Uh, they're, they're an extremely experienced firm. Uh, particularly with public entity, telephone and data systems. So we have them as our, our sort of master project uh, manager and coordinator. Each partner has a project manager, and then that we will be working through an, with each and every department. We're going to be changing things for every department that has a telephone on a desk or on a wall somewhere. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of change mm -hmm. that we're going to be making, and it's going to take some very uh, tight coordination to make that happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that is our, our strategy. And w actually, we begin uh, next Wednesday uh, to, to meet with each of those partners, make sure that they understand um, the reporting relationships, the requirements, how we will handle those situations when they occur, because we know that they will and what the process will be to work through them and resolve them quickly so that we can move forward and meet our timeline. Good. Excuse mm -hmm. me if you've already stated it, but how long do we expect to take to implement the whole program? Our goal is to have implementation no later than the end of August. Now, I'm going to put a little bit of a caveat on that, and I, I don't want to shrink back too much. When I say that goal, the one thing that I would make particularly a, a note about is 
if I get dial tone changed over to everybody's desk by the end of August and I don't quite get you the ability to text yet by the end of August and that comes in September I'll be happy <laughs> if I can just get telephones replaced systems implemented right. and I bring the other features and functionality that we're not used to yet in this organization if I just do dial tone by the end of August and get that I'll be pleased if we can go further I'll be ecstatic and if we bring those features and functionalities in September and through the fourth quarter that that will be okay from my view and perspective that's always subject to uh, management's view and perspective and and, uh, and commission's view and perspective it, right? right? absolutely correct <laughs> we serve at the pleasure so right. uh, so that's that's our goal is to replace the telephone system by the end of August and get as far into some of those other features and benefits uh, that will include the IVR for the Department of Finance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So. Sounds good. And uh, Mr. Hager, uh, while you're up there. <coughs> well, I'm not finished. Oh, Can I just Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Excuse me, Mayor. Uh, in, the, in the past few months, we had a, um, uh, 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 I think it was Franklin County or another county that had vo VoIP, and then it went through and it went down for a bit. Mm -hmm. And did we learn anything for that about redundancy and making sure? Because the systems that we have, like we've talked about in the past where when snow comes or emergencies come other public entities might close but Dayton must stay open so can have we learned from other communities on how to deal with redundancy with with VoIP uh, we we have the consultant that we've retained has experience with that um, actually one of the partners that we reach I shouldn't say partner but one of the references that we reached out to was Franklin County and we've already begun building relationships with Franklin County um, so that we can learn not only what lessons did they learn from the implementation that they went right. through because we're getting ready to face that and we wanted to be well versed what are the things to look out for and if we could avoid making a mistake that you made what would it be so we've talked a fair amount with Franklin County already and we'll co probably continue to do that we're building relationships with them already um, in terms of redundancy, without getting too far... It, yeah, I don't want to get in the weeds on it. I just want to know that we've thought about it. Yes, ma'am. Your Honor, we have, in fact, uh, considered redundancy and worked to design the system in such a way that we won't experience those issues. I cannot promise that a, a telephone will never go down that it won't be out of school. Well, we had our telephones go down, right, Mr. Soval, a couple weeks ago. So, I mean, we've had experience with this system going down. Our hope is that we have redundancy in place so we can stay up and, and go a long period of time. And we have those those in position for it to fail that we're ready to move forward. And and we have taken that into consideration. And the, the system that we're recommending is actually more robust in terms of failover than what we have today. That's good. That's great. Okay, Mr. Reardon, I'm done with my question. Uh, the other item uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Hager to talk about is item uh, number 13 on the calendar, and that's the P cards. Mr. Hager. Uh, thank you, Manager. Uh, item 13 for the procurement cards. Uh, we went with an RFP, a request for proposals. We received six responses. Uh, the existing agreement is set to expire at the end of this month. The, it is with Fifth Third Bank. Uh, from the six responses, we then went out and did some fine tuning and requested best and final offers from the top three proposals that we received. Uh, during that process, Fifth Third emerged as the clear uh, best offer that we had. So we are recommending renewal of that agreement. And, and I probably shouldn't call it a renewal because it is actually a new agreement. This is a one year with five one year options to renew. The authority that we're requesting from the Dayton City Commission this morning is frankly in excess of what we're operating the procurement card program at today, but it is intended to allow for growth. Right now we're spending between five and six million dollars a year through the procurement card program. We receive a rebate, the city receives a rebate based on the amount of velocity and volume. Uh, that goes through that program. Uh, so the numbers before you today for authorization are the maximum that we could ever see 
Our goal is to achieve where it makes sense. We use it today for small, minor procurements. Um, <coughs> we have the opportunity, in some cases, to pay P card, buy P card, some larger expenditures, and where that makes sense, we'll probably work that way to increase the size of the rebate. So the, the authority we're requesting today allows for that growth. Uh, Mr. Reed, I don't know if Mr. Hager is the person to answer this, but can we go over, I mean, this is a very large amount of authority. I want to know the audit structure and the auditing on P cards for staff. Are you ready to talk about that or did you want uh, Ms. LeBriar to talk about that? That probably is best for OMB. What I can tell you uh, is that there is a, probably best for OMB because they actually perform the audits. One of the things that we have said is we don't want to do those audits because it's our program. We should not audit our I'd own agree. program. Mm -hmm. uh, so OMB performs those audits. However, we do have the policy in place that requires, that sets the, the audit requirements. Mm -hmm. Ms. LeBriar is not here. What I'm going to ask is uh, we'll continue with a couple other items and ask the city auditor to come down to explain that. Thank you. If uh, you could get him. Um, I'd also like to thank you, Mr. Hager. Thank you. I'd like to ask uh, uh, Ms. Clements to come up and talk about item number six. It's a uh, water quality trading system. It's a small dollar figure, but I'd like you to understand a little bit about this program and what we do, Ms. Clements. Thank you. Um, good morning, Mayor, Commissioners, good morning. City Manager, Clerk, uh, Tammy Clements, Director of Water. Um, item number six on the calendar this morning is for a continuing contract with MCD um, for a water quality trading program um, that began right around 2001, 2002 is when we entered into a partnership with MCD. Um, this is a very unique partnership that we have. Um, it is a market-based trading program that really looked at nutrient management. And we kind of highlighted this as one of our challenges moving <clears throat> forward this year in 2014. Um, nutrients and the specific nutrient I'm talking about is phosphorus. Um, we anticipated a regulatory limit in our wastewater or water reclamation permit this year. We anticipated this um, beginning in about 2001, that we would be required to upgrade and to really start to treat for nutrients. Um, and we anticipated that it would come online right about this time. And so MCD spearheaded this water quality management program. We are a founding member of that program along with about five other uh, publicly operated treatment um, works across the Great Miami Watershed Basin. Um, we have significant investment in this program. Um, there is uh, non-point source and point source. It means the loading to the river. And the, the true intent of the program is to improve water quality in the Great Miami River. And so the EPA um, is working um, to improve that water quality by regulating, first of all, uh, treatment works. This program was going to allow us to work with, and we have been working with farmers since about 2005, for them to really institute best management practices in terms of how they manage their crop structures. And it is a really innovative program because they did institute a lot of um, like crop rotation and non-till and different practices which reduce the amount of nutrients um, that they have in runoff to the rivers. This innovative program is very productive because we're really getting to the point of what is causing some of the decrease in water quality in the river shed. Our program was approved by the EPA in about 2005 and we anticipated that we would be able to use the credits that we have purchased um, in compliance with this new limit that we were going to receive and we're anticipating we will receive this year. 
Um, this is, a, is going to be a critical contract for us to continue the work with MCD so that they can continue to provide advocacy on our behalf with the state regulators. Um, because we're being told that we may not be able to use the credits that we have purchased at this time to meet compliance. And so this will be critical for us moving forward. We have made a significant investor uh, investment as a founding investor, and we really do need to be able to use the, these credits because ultimately it does affect our rate structure moving forward. Um, it's going to be the difference um, between a small or moderate change to the uh, treatment works uh, all the way up to a very significant investment if we have to really meet real low limits. So uh, this is coming before you to allow us to continue <coughs> our participation in that program because it is going to be very important for us moving through 2014. I, I know that uh, the Janet Bly from the Conservancy District has also brought this up as an issue, and I know we're working in good partnership with <laughs> them, and I know it's something we're really supportive of and don't appreciate it when the rules are changed, which yeah. seems to be quite often with this administration. So I, I was actually just going to say, if, uh. if you could maybe clarify, I don't think folks understand. Okay. Uh, you, you said that uh, we might not be able to use those credits. If mm -hmm. you could talk a little bit about that, how we expected it to be and how it looks like it might be now. <coughs> Sure. The regulatory for coming from the state. Sure. When uh, we first entered into the program, the EPA was actually a partner with us in structuring the program. This is the OEPA? The Ohio yeah. EPA, the state. Right. And um, we had to submit to them what the program looked like, how it would operate. And at that time, we had their full support, and they did endorse the program, mm -hmm. our operations man uh, manual, in about 2005. And how it was to work the trading that we did with the farmers um, through a series of um, it was like a reverse auction where we would fund some of those best management practices that no the farmers, deal crop rotation mm -hmm, education were, yeah. and so when we get a limit in the permit we would be able to apply these credits towards the reduction of that nutrient load and and in that way um, we are decreasing the impact on the river, but not having to do the real capital intensive in infrastructure changes, because it is a, uh, it's a joint problem. You have your POTWs, but then you have the agriculture, which has probably a heavier um, source load to the river. And so by regulating us only, right. was not going to improve water quality. Right. We're really gonna need it to be a more holistic approach. And so um, we won't get the biggest bang for our buck by investing $25 million in the POTW. Water quality is not going to change unless we also address the non-point source, which is in the watershed through the agriculture uses as well. Ms. Clements, you want to explain what a POTW is? Public, uh, publicly operated treatment works. So uh, just, just to... to encapsulate what you said so we've expected because we put a lot of effort and because we had an agreement with the Ohio EPA into educating folks and reducing from the source of some of the of, of phosphorus that we would down the road be able to take credit for those decreases yes. and maybe not have to make the, the severe modifications to our treatment system yes. but the state is is perhaps going to change those rules uh, because it's politically easier for them that's my own you opinion uh, be, to to put more re regulation on us, even though it'll be less effective in the long run. I just wanted to make sure that folks understand that story yes, because that's it's exactly a little right. bit it's a little bit complicated, and especially if you you have been following the phosphorus very closely, it can be a little bit complicated. But I just want to make sure the word is out there that because it, uh, it makes it politically easier, not because it's a better solution, not right. because it's better for the long run or better for the state, and even breaking agreements that they made with us earlier, they may be changing the rules here. So yeah. it's just well it's really a shame. Yeah, and for and for this particular region. Um, our agriculture partners have participated yep. willingly and voluntarily with us in the program. And so they were at the table along with uh, the public, with the treatment works mm -hmm. to try to provide a more holistic um, solution as well. And so uh, not to be able to take advantage of that for this particular area, it's disappointing. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad we're doing that. That's great. That kind of outreach, I mean, these practices have been proven time and time again to help not only in reducing phosphorus, but to be good practices for, for everything across the board that helps. Yes. So thank you. I appreciate right. the clarification. All right. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,
Mm. Mayor, we now have uh, Ms. LaBriar from OMB and Jerry Blackburn, the city auditor, that can address your questions about the uh, P card auditing. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners. My apologies for not being here earlier. A um, couple of points to make in terms of the P card process. In each operating unit, there are two individuals who are responsible for How P card. How do you define an operating unit? It can, and in smaller departments, it's the department. In the larger departments, it can be within a division or with even units within the division. Mm -hmm. um, there's a P card um, administrator as well as the P card holder. So the P card holder takes care of um, making the actual transactions, but the P card administrator is responsible for checking that work not only monthly, but then doing a 100% audit during the year. The monthly activity log is there's actually the, st the P card statement itself, a credit card statement such as you're used to seeing. In addition to that, there's an activity log that summarizes that activity for the individual, usually the department director who is signing off on that and authorizing the payment for the monthly P card activity. In addition to that, there's annual training. Um, any items purchased over $500 without an existing price agreement with uh, on file with purchasing, the department has to get three separate bids and document those bids. The other thing that helps restrict purchases, as you may be familiar with what's known as commodity codes, it's a um, national system for assigning codes to different types of transactions, SIC codes, some people refer to them as. So there are specific commodity codes that are completely restricted and departments would not be allowed to purchase certain items under those commodity codes that, would, that basically would represent things that would just not be appropriate for government use. Cash advances are completely prohibited with the use of the P cards. So that's an overview of the major points in terms of the overall, and then we do regular audits of the P cards. Jerry can answer any questions that you have in terms of the actual P card audit process. Okay, yeah, can you tell us about it a bit? Sure. Uh, the policy states that every card should be audited uh, every two years. So we are on a cycle to do that. I have access to an online database that's governed, I think, by Fifth Third Bank that uh, I can go in and run reports and see different types of transactions and activity for reports and based on volumes I'll choose uh, cards to look at randomly. So when you say it's required to look every two years you really don't check every card every two years though it's a random search? No every card is looked at every two years. How, well how do you pick it then like you said it's kind of just you picked randomly so. Well I how keep do you a record of who I've looked at in the last I do it quarterly. So you just kind of pick and then you say oh in the last you haven't checked those cards. How do you keep track of that? How many cards do we have? I don't know. This is all governed by uh, purchasing. I can't speak to exactly the number of cards. I looked at 14 cards in the last quarter. I'm just, I'm, I'm a little confused because if you say that you look at every card every two years, but you only looked at 14 cards in the last quarter. 120 cards. Yeah, is that, is that right? Is there only 120 cards in the city? Uh, again, yeah. I can't Pete, speak Mr. to the total here. Mr. Hager's here. The last time, Your Honor and Commissioners and Manager, the, the clerk, the last time that I counted the number of cards, and it's been a couple of months ago, uh, we were around 200, maybe a little less. We don't have that many P cards out there in use. Um, as far as the policy goes, the other thing, and Ms. LeBriar spoke to some of the policy, some of the, the governing policy issues. Most cards are limited to a $500 per transaction limit. These really are intended for small operational types of procurements uh, to expedite, get what you need, get back to work. We don't go through a long, lengthy requisitioning process. Uh, many times the purchasing division does, in fact, have price agreements established for those types of supplies. This then becomes the transactional processing mechanism that allows the user to say, okay, I need this many feet of cable or pipe or whatever the commodity is. Let me go and use this card as the transactional process mechanism instead of charging it against a blanket purchase order that's placed on file at the beginning of the year. 
This is to the primarily used to expedite operating issues of small spend. Purchasing does, in fact, establish price agreements for most of the, the commodities that mm -hmm. are being used with P cards. Um, the number of P cards, I can get you the actual count as of today, um, if that would help. But it is, there are just are not that many cards. I'm just, I'm just trying to understand how the audit process happens, because if it's random, I don't know how you get to all the cards if it's random. That's what I'm confused about. Well, it's, it's not completely random. I will <coughs> go into the database and see who I've looked at in the last quarter, rule them out, and then look at volumes and activity and, and make some decisions from there as to who to look at. Certainly, if there are incidences that I'm aware of that need attention, then I'll look at those, but I'm not aware of anything like that. But every two years, every card is looked at within two years? Yes. So you've made, you have a system that makes sure of that? Yes. And then other cities, do other cities do it this way with P cards? I mean, I, I, like I used to work at the county, for example, and they ne we never had these. So it's very different at the county versus the city, I think. Uh, county versus city is very different because the county comes under a different rule. Right. It's, it's obviously, the, the Dayton being a charter city, right. we, we have. Um, but yes, uh, to, to your point, uh, Your Honor, yes, other municipalities and the public jurisdictions up to and including the state of Ohio uh, do in fact have uh, audit procedures. The city has a policy that governs the use of this. That is what the audits are performed to ensure that they, that those policies have uh, been adhered to throughout. Um, one of the things that Ms. LeBriar didn't mention that I think might be important to note um, so for the commission, uh, that policy not only stipulates all of the things that she said, in terms of what's restricted, things like cash advances and other uh, commodity codes mm -hmm. that would be inappropriate for government use. Mm -hmm. But the other step that the city of Dayton took when we implemented P cards in 1994 was to establish four and only four templates of what can, of commodity codes that could be used. For certain individuals, they can use it for travel mm -hmm. to pay for training and travel. The, the city, and I don't, boy, I might catch, catch it later for this, the city manager probably would be authorized to use his card to pay for travel expenses mm -hmm. because he might travel on city business. However, the person who is in an operating capacity who needs to go procure that cable or that pipe probably is not travel authorized. So even after we've restricted the commodity codes that can be acquired utili utilizing the P card, then we established four distinct templates and we essentially say, you fit this template, this template, this template, or th and that's it. Those are the only four that we authorize and allow. So that's another precaution that we take in terms of, and that's a little unique for the city of Dayton. Um, other jurisdictions that I've spoken with since we implemented P cards in 94 have actually said that's really creative, that's a great idea. We're going to model ours after what you've done because it helps restrict the activity. Since 94, so this is 20 years, we've had P cards. Are there things that we've put in place that we've learned from other communities to do more restrictions or to uh, update our policy? We have updated the policy a couple of times. I don't know if it's because we've learned it so much from other jurisdictions as it's lessons learned as we have uh, operated the program here at the city of Dayton. My experience has been, as I've talked to my colleagues around the, the different uh, jurisdictions around the nation, really have been that they're saying your policy's probably sounder and your ideas on the templates better idea than what we have in place. We haven't taken those steps. We want to follow what you've done. Then I have another question for the auditor. So when you audit these, do you just audit that quarter, or how far do you go back, or how do you do it? Again, it depends on the, uh, the reports that I see out of the database that, that talk about spending. There are certain departments that use it quite a bit, such as fleet out in the garage, you're using it to buy a lot of parts. They have a lot more activity than, let's we'll say, the one in the management budget. So right. again, it, it depends on what I see in the way of volumes, and if there's anything that strikes me as, as far as types of transactions or amounts. Thank you. I just wanted to highlight two other items. Item number 10 is the uh, contract with Wright Brothers Aero to provide our porter services at the airport. 
This was the result of an RFP. They were the winning uh, a proposer, and they have done this service before. And then just also highlight item number 17, which is the case management grant that HRC has gotten, has received for the serve process. And that's all I have today, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ms. Lavender, are there any citizens to speak on calendar items? I have none. No citizens registered to speak. Commissioners, do you have any comments on calendar items? I have a couple. I thought you might, Commissioner <laughs> Lovelace. Oh, really? I know. I'm shocked. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I just um, want to make a comment on um, items 3 and 13. You know, I, I, I'm going to vote on these two items. You know, these are the Fifth Third Bank. Um, but I want to also remind Fifth Third of, the, of, their, of their role and, and their promise. You know, that I was at that meeting back, back in the 90s or, yeah, back in the 90s, which they, in fact, promised to bring back their facility to Southwest Dayton. Just know that we're still waiting for Fifth Third to re relocate a branch or a bank within Southwest Dayton. So uh, know that we're watching you, so uh, live up to your promise. And uh, I had a point of clarification for, for 16, uh, you know, the vacant property ordinance that we passed a few months past, uh, will, that, will that also uh, cover this, this newly an annexed area or, because I know that it was limited to certain zip codes, so I don't know whether this zip code is part of that, uh, part of that. Commissioner, my understanding is this particular one is just, it's uh, one parcel that's related to one company. Yeah. Am I correct on that? It wouldn't be a vacant. Yes, anyway. so it's, it's just one parcel, it's a commercial parcel. Okay. That's all not it a, is. Not a residential. Okay, well, I, wanna, I still want to get an update on the, uh, the, the uh, expansion of that we'll, we'll BPO. BP let me know about when you're ready for that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just want to say, first of all, I'm going to abstain on 3 and 13. I usually abstain on the banking issues. Um, I do want to say, though, in terms of particularly the item that was discussed on the P card, um, I commend the mayor for the question she's, at, she's asked. Um, I've sat in a lot of conversations about P cards, and there's lots of, there's always a lot of questions about P cards. They are um, a place where there's opportunity for, for fraud um, and certainly for misuse. I think some of the um, plans that have been put in place by staff, the audits, um, sound like a good step in that regard. Um, my experience has been that as long as you're having um, a superior to approve um, the P-card use, um, you're usually in pretty good shape. And as long as there's an overall process to audit everything, um, that's real helpful. But um, I do think the mayor's questions yeah. were, were very appropriate. Uh, and I've, I've heard the, I've been sat in meetings like this much longer, actually. I have it. But, um, many times and, and those type of questions come up quite a bit mm -hmm. um, the other thing I wanted to um, comment on was just on number 17 I do want to thank the county um, for their um, participation and their um, um, pledge of the $60,000 on for serve that's a very important program to the entire community uh, it's not just a Dayton program it's a multi-jurisdictional program and there are many participants both um, actually participating and funding this process and uh, whenever we get funds and help uh, we certainly appreciate it mayor if we can mm -hmm. have a separate motion for calendar items 3 and 13. thank you miss lavender mm -hmm. any other comments okay may i have a motion to approve the city manager's recommendations with the exceptions of calendar items number 3 and 13. so moved your honor second the motion it's been properly moved and second to approve the city manager's recommendations with the exception of calendar items 3 and 13. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. May I have a motion to approve calendar items 3 <coughs> and 13? So moved, Your Honor. Second. second. It's been properly moved and seconded to approve <laughs> calendar items 3 and 13, noting Commissioner Williams' abstention. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Legislation. First reading emergency resolution number 6022-14, approving the statement of services to be furnished to the property owners of 2875 Nemore Road when it has been annexed to the city of Dayton, Ohio, and declaring an emergency. Your Honor, resolution number 6022-14, been declared an emergency. I move for submitted passage. Second the motion, Your Honor. It's been properly moved and seconded to adopt emergency resolution number 6022-14. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? 
Second reading, emergency resolution number 6022-14, approving the statement of services to be furnished to the property owners of 2875 Needmore Road when it has been annexed to the City of Dayton, Ohio. Mayor Whaley? Aye. Commissioner Lovelace? Aye. Williams? Aye. Joseph? Aye. Mims? Aye. First reading, emergency resolution number 6023-14, authorizing the acceptance of $60,000 from Montgomery County for case management services to serve participants in declaring an emergency. Your Honor, being declared an emergency, I move for the passage of resolution number 6023-14. I'll second, Your Honor. It's been properly moved and seconded to adopt emergency resolution number 6023-14. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Second reading emergency resolution number 6023-14, authorizing the acceptance of $60,000 from Montgomery County for case management services to serve participants. Mayor Whaley? Aye. Commissioners Lovelace? Aye. Williams? Aye. Joseph? Aye. Mims? Aye. Informal resolution number 884-14, disapproving of the state's action to restrict citizens' access to the ballot, urging the state to repeal these restrictions, and calling upon the state to work instead on increasing citizens' access to the ballot. Your Honor, I move for the immediate approval of informal resolution number 884-14. It's been properly moved and seconded to adopt a for informal resolution number 884-14. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And that concludes the legislation, Your Honor. One comment on 884, and appreciate commission support on, on that effort. Um, I think there was a story in the Dayton Daily News this week about why we passed this resolution. I should also mention that there is a ballot initiative underway uh, to put uh, voting rights in the Constitution, since this would be time number five, I believe, that the legislature or the Secretary of State in some manner has tried to limit or curb access to the ballot box, specifically in the city of Dayton and other urban areas. So uh, those petitions are getting organized. We will have them here at City Hall, so people, if they're interested in pulling those petitions or getting those, we're happy to help them get them as it protects our citizens' access to the ballot box. Your Honor, uh, additionally, I'd like to comment on that as well. Uh, yeah, a lot of this generated from, I guess, some scare tactic about the issue of fraud happening across the nation as far as voting was concerned. And uh, a lot of time and a lot of money was spent trying to identify and find all this fraud that was happening. And uh, after all the dust had settled, they found 88 cases in the entire nation where there was fraud. And so a lot of these bills to uh, solve a problem that basically never exists is, is what we're facing right now, which further limits the opportunity for the average citizen to vote. So, so again, uh, in, in concert with the mayor and my fellow commissioners, uh, I strongly support this. Commissioner Mims, once the, the, the folks who are trying to limit ballot access found out that fraud wasn't nearly as prevalent as they thought it was, there were only a handful of cases in Ohio over the last 10 or 12 years, right. uh, they're now moving on to uh, the, a fundamentally dishonest sheen of uh, making things the same for everybody. But what, they're, what, the, what that is is they, they can say that, but what they're really trying to do is not take into account that different folks in different places work at different times, are available at certain times, and uh, people in our locality, we, we, we might uh, have a uh, preponderance of folks that need to vote on weekends exactly. or need to vote uh, after normal hours. Um, so by making uh, one standard, they're, they're, they're hewing to the standard, they're ignoring the fact that, uh, willfully ignoring the fact that uh, they're going to be cutting down the number of people voting. And that is fundamentally dishonest, fundamentally wrong, and I urge folks to, to support the ballot initiative that the mayor just mentioned. It's very important to make sure that everybody who can vote mm -hmm. can. Thank you. Good. And thank you thank for you. your, your all support in the effort. I know we'll be active <coughs> in that effort. We have a fast timeline to, uh, to get on the ballot, which seems to be a yearly endeavor these days. Uh, and you know we need to get um, hundreds of thousands of signatures across the state of Ohio. I think the timeline's around August, so we'll be putting those together and pushing them out. And if people are interested, they can definitely call us here at 333-3636 to come and get a petition to circulate. Okay, Mr. Reardon, you may proceed with your board, board appointment. Your Honor, I'd like to recommend the reappointment of Ms. Jan Lepore Gentleson as a city appointment and to reappoint Dr. Gary Leroy as the physician, physician appointment to the Public Health Dayton and Montgomery County Board for a term ending December 31st, 2019. May I have a motion to concur with the city manager's recommendation? Your Honor, I move to concur with the city manager's recommendation to reappoint Ms. Jan Lepore Gentleson as a city appointment 
and to reappoint Dr. Gary Leroy as the physician appointment to the Public Health Dayton and Montgomery County Board for a term ending December 31st, 2019. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded to reappoint Ms. Jan Lafour Jendelson as a city appointment and to reappoint Mr. Dr. Gary Leroy as the physician appointment to the Public Health Dayton and Montgomery County Board for a term ending December 31st, 2019. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ms. Lavender, are there any citizens registered to speak? Your Honor, we have one citizen that is registered to speak, and at this time I would like to state there is a three minute time limit. As you address the commission, we ask that you state your name and address for the record, and at that time I will turn on the green light. When the green light comes on, you will have the three minutes to speak. After you have spoken two and a half minutes, a yellow light will come on. You then will have 30 seconds remaining to speak. When the red light comes on, you'll be asked to cease your comments and to take your seat. I call forward Mr. Ellis Hutchinson. Uh, my name is Ellis Hutchinson. I live in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, right here in, in downtown Dayton, address, matter of fact. Uh, 211 South Wilkinson Street. Okay, you may begin. All right, thank you. Uh, good morning, Mayor, Commissioner, City Manager, uh, Department Heads, and fellow citizens. Uh, I came here today to uh, talk about the Standing for MAC program that was held Saturday, September the 15th at the library. And I wanted to thank you commissioners for your donations and because of your donations, we were able to uh, supply the people that were present with some light refreshments. Um, uh, there was one disappointment, the, the fact that none of you would, had an opportunity to show up. And I know you all have very, very busy schedules, so I forgive you all for that. Um, since that program, I've been talking to a lot of people in the community, and there's a lot of people in the community who feel that this program should be an annual program. So there's going to be a meeting at the library on April the 12th for people who want to get involved in possibly making that happen and to discuss that. We're going to be calling like a potluck. We want to make it more social than formal. So uh, it's going to be from 4 to 6 in the meeting room at the library. Uh, if any of you wish to come and stick your head in and offer some suggestions, uh, that would be very much appreciated. Uh, there was also a lot of people who felt that the fact that the park at Riverview and Edward Moses will be named after W.S. McIntosh and that uh, you have the scholarship program that's here. Matter of fact, we had Ms. Henderson from the University of Dayton who came and spoke on the program. Mm -hmm. And she also stated that uh, it wasn't really being utilized as much as it could. There's, there's not as many students applying for the program as possible. And if that doesn't change, there's a possibility that we could lose the program. So maybe one thing y'all can do is encourage people to apply for the program and make sure that it's, that it's utilized. Um, but there was a lot of people who felt that even though those things are very, very nice, that they felt that the city may be a little lax in, re in, in actually recognizing the accomplishments and the things that W.S. McIntosh done in the city and for the city. So um, nobody's made any suggestions possibly what you could do, but maybe that's something you can think about. Because uh, the contribution that W.S. McIntosh made to the city of Dayton all great, you know, and um, I mean, I, I, I would put his name with some of the other pioneers that we give credit for in the city of Dayton. Um, I also want to take this opportunity, I said I thank you, I also want to take this opportunity to thank all the other people who are involved in, in promoting this program. I know y'all see me, but I'm definitely not the only person that's involved. We had people who don donated their time to be speakers, we had people who donated their time to provide entertainment, and I want to publicly thank them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Hutchinson. Thank you. thank you for keep putting it together. Thank you. Sorry we couldn't make it, but we're glad to um, be supportive of it. That's all, Your Honor. Mr. Reardon, do you have any closing comments? I have one, Your Honor. Ms. Lavender, any closing comments? Yes. Just a reminder, the work sessions regarding citizens' engagement overview, finance briefing committee, and false alarms will be held at the conclusion of the meeting in the city manager's large conference room. And that's all, Your Honor. Okay. Commissioners, yes. any closing comments? Yes. you got 15, 16 days to do your taxes, so uh, know that you can call 913-2000 to... Uh, to schedule a time to go in over at the Job Center or at the Community Action Agency, 719 South Main Street to uh, get your taxes prepared free. Emphasis on free. <laughs> so, um, 
don't wait till the last moment to count down to one one day because you're too late. So okay. just you know, about 16 days to get your taxes prepared. Or really, you got 21 days. Commissioner, what was that number again? 913 2000. And that'll get you to the job center the where there's a team of UD students and volunteers there to help you get your taxes prepared. Thank you. I want anything else, Commissioner? That's all. Okay. Um, I just want to commend um, some of our local students. Um, last week I had the opportunity to go to uh, Ponitz High School. They had a uh, a, a talent show and um, I actually was going there for another event and the, uh, the other event was rescheduled and I just happened to be there when they were doing a talent show and I couldn't leave I mean these these, these students were so talented with the um, with what they could do in terms of um, singing poetry dance um, co comedians um, it really sharp sharp kids over opponents um, and then I also had an opportunity to go to Stivers and um, Perhaps Ms. Crosby would, might want to um, elaborate. Uh, I saw she was there also because I know there's a, a culmination of this. But we've had a number of poetry slams at different high schools to try to get young people to use this forum as a way to engage and um, just learn how to communicate and express themselves. Um, and it's also very interesting to hear what these young people had to say in terms of their view on the world, on our community, on how they are viewed through the form of a poetry slam. And so we had an opportunity to do that um, last Friday evening, and I thought it was great. And as I understand, there's going to be a, a culmination of, of all these winners from these different poetry slams, and they're going to have a big event. And Ms. Crosby, I'm glad you're here, because I've taken about as far as I can go. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to you. Actually, Stivers was the first slam that I was able to see the entire, um, the entire slam, and it was awesome. I was really impressed by the students and normally we take three winners and one um, one additional winner in case one of the three has to drop out. At Stivers we had to take five and none of them were runner-up so all of them will compete at the Grand Slam that's going to, t to occur on Friday April 25th. I believe it starts at 8 o'clock. It's at um, the Ponent's um, Sinclair Building 12. So we're really excited about that. Um, what happens is each high school had an opportunity to have a slam we took three winners, so we have about 21 students. Well, now we have 23 students that are going to be competing that evening. We are in the process of securing um, some hip-hop artists to come in and serve as judges, along with um, HBO Deaf po Poets. The three top winners will have an opportunity to choose from either going on to a national slam to kind of get a feel for what that's about. It's in Philadelphia in July, and that's sponsored by the Dayton Boys Club or they can choose from a scholarship from Sinclair. So those three top winners will have an opportunity to, to choose one or the other. And then the next three winners or the next three students with the highest scores will, will have an opportunity to choose from what prizes are left. So we're really excited about that. Um, it's, it's coming together great. We've had a lot of good feedback. I am really impressed by uh, the students that have participated, what's on their minds, the, the way that they've been able to express themselves, the support from the Dayton Police Department our, and our, our partners and the other law enforcement jurisdictions has been amazing and then the other thing that I learned the other day is that we've been working with Wright State University on a strategic planning process and we actually have two law enforcement officers that are graduate students in the Masters of Public Administration program and both are law enforcement officers um, one from Miamisburg and he had an opportunity to attend the slam on Friday and he had never participated in a, in a slam before and he was really amazed and impressed by the amount of um, courage, the, the talents of the students, but he was also impressed by the issues that the students talked about uh, because he had never expressed that or experienced that before. So it's been a really good partnership with Dayton Public Schools and metaphorically speaking, we're looking forward to preparing for next year and I hope to see you all April 25th and 26th at, at Sinclair uh, for the Grand Slam and then also for our forum around community police relations and how hip hop has impacted that. Great, mm -hmm. thank, thank you. you. And thank you. Before, well, you, you can take a seat. I'm, I, I can finish it up on my own, thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I do want to say um, I'm glad you mentioned though we did a special thank you to the police department um, when I went Friday um, I, I could I noticed at least four or five police officers and I think there were some in plain clothes so may not have recognized them but um, I just want to say thank you very much the reason HRC is involved is because um, we have an initiative within the city and partnering with others that we want to try to improve relations between the community and the police and part of that improvement is going to come by having the community get a better understanding of the job 
that police officers have to deal with every day and also having police officers have a better understanding with some of the issues or, or, or ideas that folks in the community have. So uh, the fact that we have police officers who took the time to go out to listen to the young people um, I think is um, an admirable thing and I want to say thank you very much for that. Great, thank you. Yeah, I, I want to add also, I, I attend, uh, attended one of those programs, I think it was a year or two ago, and there was some young man that was so talented, and the name escapes me, that he would take a word from anyone in the audience and he would turn it into a positive rap right there instantly. And he did that with about five or six words, and everyone there was just tremendously uh, amazed with the creativity and the talent of that, uh, that young man. So these types of things, again, uh, are, are just tremendous in terms of giving our young people another platform to display some of their talents in a very positive and creative way. So. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just have two, two things to say. First is, uh, well, go Flyers, of course. Uh, go Flyers. Nice. I was wondering if somebody was mentioned that. those young people. Yep. <laughs> uh, second is uh, the mayor and I were invited, uh, actually uh, all of us uh, were were invited. The mayor and I went to the FOP awards dinner a couple nights ago. And they uh, did it quickly so we could watch the Flyers game. They did. That's why I wanted to bring it up. Uh, Mike Galbraith, the FOP president, uh, made sure that he sped through the agenda so we could watch the last bit of the game. Uh, we appreciate that. Also, we want to say congratulations to the officers uh, who were retired. Uh, a lot of folks were honored for length of service. Uh, we we're proud to be there and proud to be part of the ceremony. Um, I'm sorry to jump in again. I'm done. I couldn't attend the FOP because I had already made a commitment. Habitat for Humanity also had a really big <laughs> fundraiser. It's always it, something going on. There is. You know. right. Habitat, if we're not well, there, we're somewhere else. I'm, I'm yeah. happy that I was able to attend Habitat for Humanity's um, fundraiser um, this past Saturday night. And it was a, a nice fundraiser. And obviously, Habitat for Humanity is a wonderful organization that we should, we should continue to support. And we did get out in time to see the Flyers game. Good. It's very important that <laughs> basketball's on the mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to uh, also add, uh, this past Monday, the NAACP uh, sponsored a, a forum, and I was a panelist to talk about what the churches could do to support the communities and the school's achievement as far as the third grade guarantee is concerned. Um, about an hour and a half, two-hour program. Anytime you're with uh, Derek Forward, it's going to be at least an hour and a half, two-hour program. <laughs> but it was very, very positive in terms of addressing those issues. And, and we found that there are a lot of churches that are currently involved in doing some things to help uh, young people with regards to that. Uh, so much so, with so much diversity, that they're going to uh, contact uh, virtually every church just to get an idea of what they're doing so they can communicate that uh, so that everyone would be more aware of the types of things that are happening. Um, I mean, everything from uh, reading uh, in Sunday school, setting aside different times, tutoring after school, tutoring on the weekends, uh, making special presentations and recognition to students who are achieving very well in all areas of, in terms of school, uh, at the church, in front of everybody in the congregation. So there's just a tremendous amount of things that are going on, and we certainly applaud and appreciate them for uh, their role and their steps to assist the mayor and the commission in the uh, City of Learners uh, program. That was great. Thanks for participating, mm -hmm. Commissioner. I was, this is funny. I mean, I'm just sitting here. I mean, we, if we did this every week, we could probably do this for 20 minutes. But I just kind of want to say for the community, we, we don't always say everything that we do right. because, one, to probably bore you guys, but, but two, um, it would add an extra 15 to 20 minutes to the to the meeting every week. And I don't, I'm sure we didn't mention everything that we did last I, week. No. I'm sure I did not. <laughs> we did not. So um, anyway, it's just interesting to hear it every now and then. But. Um, I would say that we don't have to do this every week, right, guys? Correct, okay. correct. I do have, I do have two <laughs> announcements. Number one, you have, while well, Commissioner Joseph, uh, Commissioner Joseph, Commissioner Lovelace mentions uh, the 20 days to get your taxes done. There are five days left to get covered for the Affordable Care Act. Wow. So yeah. please go online if you have an a adult child, an adult friend, especially young people that aren't taking this seriously because they are infallible until they miss the jump shot, right? Or uh, and fall wrong on their leg or have a car accident. We need everyone to get covered. We need that peace of mind, and we need our citizens to take take advantage of it. So, just reminding everyone: five days until the deadline to get covered. And you know, I'm just super pleased. Uh, I just wanted to say, in general, how excited the community is and how much they rallied around the University of Dayton Flyers. Uh, this, uh, there you go. Yeah, this past um, uh, uh, this past weekend, it's been a, it's been a great run for the 
to the Sweet 16, and I mean, I'm very excited about their opportunities to, to reach the Final yeah. Four. Uh, but more importantly, I think that the excitement that's been generated in the community around, um, around the, the Flyers has been uh, something that's uh, showed the awakeness of spring, I think, in Dayton, and just how, how, uh, how great our community is in showcasing the community. So we're just really proud of the, the guys and proud of the work that, that they've been doing representing our community. And um, go Flyers, Thursday, 7-15. Are any of you guys going to the game? My husband is going to the game. My brother is going. So I'll be here, but I have about eight friends going, so they'll be caravanning down. So with that, no further business to be coming before the city commission. Go Flyers. This meeting is adjourned.